And so we do that, and that's our call. Tonight we'll be gathering. We don't normally have an evening gathering, but, but we will be gathering tonight at 6 p.m. There'll be a panel discussion, and so you're invited. Hope that you can be a part of that as well. So we've invited Joseph back home to be with us. I'm going to invite him to come on out right now and introduce Joseph to you. Um, well, I think he's here. So, Joseph. There he is. Okay, there he is right there. So come on out. And um, thanks for being a, a part of, of today. Um, we talked earlier, and it really was a question of, of, you know, how do we live this out in the biblical way, right? And That's right. Um, um, we'll be introducing to you tonight a video, um, just a little sh short video, that really um, answers the question, it's critical race theory, biblical. But you're here today, so thank you for coming. Thank you. And uh, Thank you, Tom. God bless you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm glad that you guys are here, and I hope you're glad to be here. Um, this is something of a homecoming for me, and I, I know that I, there are going to be many friendly faces in the audience today, and so I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that you guys were going to come. Um, you know, when, I, when, we, when we scheduled this a couple months ago or whatever it was, I was thinking, you know, I, I'd actually moved it from next weekend to this weekend for my schedule, and, he, uh, and I was thinking, well, it's the middle of August, that's kind of prime vacation season in Washington, there's probably not even going to be anybody there. And I was expecting that people would be otherwise engaged, but uh, I'm thrilled to see that some people are interested in this conversation. And, you know, the, the truth is, uh, th this question is, is critical race theory biblical? Um, for those of you who are interested in that question, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I hope that the course of this conversation would allow us to basically apply this to any conversation that we have, because the goal of our lives as, uh, as believers, is to ask the question, is blank biblical? Is everything biblical? And that's the framework through which we approach our lives. And so that's the goal today, is to figure out if critical race theory, and I have lost the cursor on my screen. Okay, it's back. It's going to make it easier for me to like do things. So um, the starting assumptions for our conversation today, for those of us who are Christians, foundation of this conversation and basically every conversation we ever have. First thing we need to understand, God created us, right? If, you, if you're struggling with that one, this conversation is going to be confusing. Second, he knows what's best for us, okay? That's our second assumption. And our third assumption is the Bible is true and holds the key to human flourishing. If God knows what's best for us, he has actually made that knowable to us and that truth, as revealed to us in Scripture, actually contains the key to human flourishing for your life, for my life, for our nation, for the world, for our community, for the library, wherever it is. The truth of Scripture holds the key to human flourishing. To the extent that we apply it to our lives, it goes better for us. To the extent that we try to reject that, as we did in Genesis chapter 3 and have been doing ever since, we create trouble for ourselves, right? That's the human story. We are all... We are all um, we are all oppressors in that sense, and that we have rejected God, and we have gone our own way, and we have contributed to the pain in the world. The beauty of Scripture is that God has provided answers for us. Now, because we are in a spiritual battle, we know, and Scripture reveals this to us in many ways, bad ideas exist. And this is also part of the foundation. I want to talk just a couple ways which Scripture reveals this to us. In, in Colossians 2.8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Okay, so Paul in this letter to the Colossians is recognizing the spiritual war between good and evil, truth and lies that always exists, and recognizing that in the world we are always being exposed to things that are not true. There are people for good and out of good motives and sometimes out of very bad motives who are trying to deceive us, to tell us things that aren't true for their gain, for our harm, some combination of the two of those. That's always happening. Ephesians 4.14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. And I love kind of the imagery of James uses this also about being a ship, a ship. 
blown about in the, by, the, by the wind, by human cunning, by craftiness and evil schemes. That we need to understand the truth. We have to have our anchor firmly in the word of God because there are all sorts of doctrines, ideas, philosophies that are trying to pull us away from that. This is not a new experience. Critical race theory is not the first time something has ever come up that might be inconsistent with the gospel. And you probably came up with something last week. So, right, we're all going to kind of own this in various ways. So, what is critical race theory? And I'm going to do the answer to this question a terrible injustice because we could really take about three days trying to argue, trying to figure this out. And there is, as best I can tell, there is no consensus answer to this question, even among the proponents of critical race theory. I have thrown up there, and you probably can't read it because it's very small. This is the Wikipedia definition, and I go to Wikipedia just so you know this isn't like some like right-wing cabal definition of what critical race theory is. And I'll read this to you. It's, it's obtuse and it's kind of hard to like get through, but just for the purpose of the exercise, critical race theory is a body of legal scholarship and academic movement of U.S. civil rights scholars and activists who seek to critically examine the intersection of race and U.S. law and challenge the mainstream American liberal approaches to racial justice. CRT examines social, cultural, legal issues primarily as they relate to race and racism in the United States. Got it? Right? So that, again, there's so much to say about what this means. And, and there is a great debate within the critical race theory debate about whether critical race theory is simply a tool that allows us to understand and examine whether racism exists and what role it's played in our country, or whether critical race theory is a worldview. And the reality is, both people are kind of probably right in, in the sense that they want it to be right because we're fighting about a definition and there's no actual fixed definition of these things. And it has been used as a way to examine things, but the most of our conversation is going to be about what the implications of its assumptions are and how that does lead to a worldview, how it leads to a set of assumptions, it leads to a hierarchy in the way we prioritize things that are important in life that are not consistent with the hierarchy and the values that we see God wants for us in Scripture. So I'm going to do my best to outline this in a way that is... Um, that is um, that would be accepted by proponents of, of critical race theory as we kind of just describe what this is. So we have a target that we're going to kind of try to deal with and, and be able to define this. So there are four claims of critical race theory that we're going to discuss. There, might, there, there are certainly more than this, but these four kind of, I think, uh, describe what we're dealing with. First, there is a social binary of oppressed and oppressors. We're not going to get into the heritage of this. Uh, Karl Marx was basically the, the critical theorist. Understand him to be the first kind of real critical theorist. Uh, he never used that term, but he kind of really in a, in a different context outside of race uh, framed the world in terms of oppressors and the oppressed. And so critical theory sets up the world that we live in, there are oppressors and there are oppressed, and significantly, the oppressors are always trying to oppress the oppressed. That's kind of the starting assumption about the way the world operates. The second thing they say, this oppression happens in part through ideology, which is called hegemonic power. Now, what in the world is hegemonic power? And I actually have some quotes here that I'm not going to spend the time to read because it's just too academic, and we got too much other stuff to go, go through. But basically, in my house, my kids and I are the hegemonic powers for our dogs, right? We determine how things go. And in the same way, my wife and I are the hegemonic powers in our household for our children. Hegemonic power is a real thing. It exists. Um, but critical race theory sets up hegemonic power always as a problem and something to be overthrown because it's used in, in bad ways. And again, I, I talked about these quotes that I'm not actually going to read. If you want to read them, you can come see these later, kind of from critical race theorists uh, perspective, talking about what hegemonic power is. But essentially, it's this idea that there are powerful people within a dynamic, and they kind of set the rules. They define what common sense is. They, they define what normative is. And that kind of thing does exist. The third claim of CRT. Lived experience gives the oppressed special access to the truth. So in this framework, your experience 
is true to you, my experience is true to me, and we have to defer to other people's experience as the, the, the ultimate truth, even if it, it may collide with other ways in which truth could be described and defined. And we're going to talk about that as we go. Now, and actually, I real, will read this. Margaret Anderson, um, the idea that objectivity, and this is describing this phenomenon within CRT, the idea that objectivity is best reached only through rational thought is a Western and masculine way of thinking, one that we will challenge throughout this book, right? So typically we think about truth and false, right and wrong, and they're saying that is a Western idea, a Western masculine idea, and there's other ways of finding the truth. Uh, this quote, Cooper Thomas, can white men understand oppression, um, also says this, also makes this point. Heterosexual white men in this society tend to have a dualistic view of the world. We are either right or wrong, winners or losers. There's only one truth, and we will fight with one another to determine whose truth is right. To understand oppression requires that we accept others' experiences as truthful, even though they may be very different from ours. To live with equality in a diverse, plural, pluralistic society, we have to accept the fact that all groups and individuals have a legitimate claim to what is true and real for them. Okay? That's the fourth claim. Uh, actually, that's the third claim. The fourth claim of CRT. Social justice demands liberation of the oppressed groups. And so when we talk about critical race theory, there's three words. There's critical, race, and theory. We all know what a theory is, right? It tries to explain something. A critical theory tries to explain something but also have a solution, that there is a, there, there is a proposed solution to this. So critical theory is distinct from critical race theory. But critical theory always sets up the oppressors and the oppressed. But then, when you layer critical race theory on top of critical theory, it defines the categories of oppressed and oppressors based on your race. That is essentially critical race theory. And this is important to understand. And this actually might be helpful for some, and it might be frustrating for some. Critical race theorists do not define racism the same way you do. You and I have grown up most of our lives thinking the racists are people who put white hoods on their, on their hats and they burn crosses in people's yards and they use terrible language to refer to people. They think of themselves as better than other people because of the color of their skin. That is not how critical race theorists see racism. And I'm going to give you a great example from yesterday to explain why. This is a headline in the Los Angeles Times. Larry Elder is the black face of white supremacy. You've been warned. Now, for those of you who don't know what's going on here, Larry Elder is running for governor in California. There's a recall election against Gavin Newsom. Larry Elder has put himself on the ballot as one of the alternatives to Gavin Newsom. Larry Elder is right of center on most things. He's kind of libertarian on some social issues. But they, from their framework, Larry Elder is the face of white supremacy despite being a black person because he does not agree with their solution to the problem of oppression. He doesn't agree with all their proposed policies. And because they see oppression, and because they have defined racism so that racism is not believing you're better than somebody else or treating somebody terribly because of the color of their skin, it's, it's inequity in the, the way, in outcomes based on skin color. So if in any, any inequity exists, it is necessarily racist, regardless of the intentions of anyone involved. Therefore, anybody who does not agree with their solutions to solve the inequity is upholding racists, thereby they are racist people, right? So it might make you feel better to know that despite, you, that they don't mean that you sit around and think terrible things about people when they say you're racist. You're just racist because you aren't as active as they are in trying to solve problems in the same way they are. Now, where the Bible and CRT agree, and I think this is important because in every idea that is ultimately not true, it is effective and deceptive because it has elements of things that are true, right? And so we want to understand where is there any overlap with, uh, with, with scripture. And the first one is injustice affects groups, not just individuals. This is an emphasis of uh, the critical race theorists, and this is also true. 
Chattel slavery was not just an offense against individuals. It was an offense against a class of people. The Holocaust was not just an offense against individual Jewish people. It was, a, it was systemic against a whole group of people based on that group identity. So that dynamic definitely exists. The second thing, hegemonic power is real. And I d d discussed that um, in a moment or, or, or earlier. But the fact that it's real... Um, standards of beauty. There's a hegemonic power that is told us generally, those of us who are, are parents of teenage daughters, right? We're trying to push back on this hegemonic concept of what makes you beautiful because media and magazines and everything they see on Instagram is telling them this is what beauty is, but you're trying to say, no, 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 no. That's not beauty. This is beauty as God defined it, right? This is fleeting and this is temporary. This is actual beauty. Moral relativism is a hegemonic value system that has been created by the culture. You can do whatever you want. They've created this common sense. Of course, I can do whatever I want as long as nobody else gets hurt. Hegemonic power exists and is real. Those influences, and they come different places, of course. And the th third point where the Bible and CRT agree, God hates oppression. And this needs to be emphasized. And we'll read some of the scripture about this. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their case and take the life of those who rob them. Right? God hates oppression. The fourth way that CRT and the Bible agree God wants us to come to the aid of the oppressed. And this is really important. Christianity is not passive. The gospel is not passive. It doesn't allow us to just sit back and say, oh, that's too bad. Do not have any part with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We'll see what uh, David wrote about this in the Psalms. Give justice. This is the, the active part of Christianity. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked, right? We can't sit by when we see things that are wrong happening. Open your mouths for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. So there is overlap. And because we, because the gospel calls us to oppose injustice, that's where there's, that's where people look at something like critical race theory and say, hey, they're trying to stop oppression. Jesus is trying to stop oppression. We must be on the same team. And in some sense, we are on the same team because we've identified similar things that are wrong, but there are also some challenges. And that's where we get into the next part of this, where the Bible and CRT disagree. Well, first point, while the Bible roots our identity in being image bearers of God, CRT roots our identity in our race. And this is really important. For those of you who have ever read St. Augustine, you might know something about ordered loves is that it's okay for me to love ice cream. It's okay for me to like, love football. It's just not okay for me to love ice, ice cream and football more than God and my wife, right? You can love different things in different ways, and you have to keep those things in order. And that's so it is with our identity. Things that affect your life. These things are totally relevant to you and your kid's life. Your athletic ability. Studies have shown athletes, people who compete in high school athletics, do better in life than people who don't on balance. Attractiveness. We know that this is relevant to all sorts of things. Intelligence. People with 180 IQ do better in life with people with an 80 IQ. Race. It's relevant. It matters in ways that it shouldn't, but it does. Your parents' marriage, especially today. The best privilege that you can have in the world, in a, at least in the Western world, is having your parents who raised you and stayed together their whole lives. One of the best privileges that exists in the world. Height. This actually matters. I'm going to show you this. Forbes magazine, April of 2020. To be exact, the research estimates that each additional centimeter of height is associated with a 1.3% increase in annual income. In other words, a person who was five feet six inches making $50,000 per year would expect to make about 2,000 more if you were five foot seven and 4,000 more if they were five feet eight. Okay? So we all have a height. And that height, we may not have known it until right now, is relevant to how your life has happened or 
will happen, okay? The question is, what is the most important thing about you? Because those of us who might be smaller than average might be frustrated to know this, does that mean that I now need to see myself, my, my primary identity, I compare myself to everyone else based on my height compared to their height? Oh, you're 6'3", therefore, you know, we're at war, right? Even though that is a real thing. The, the numbers tell us that a person who's 6'3", is more likely to make more money than me. Is that always the case? Of course not. But that's the data. And so the question is, what is the most important part of our identity? The Bible has a different sense of who we are. How the Bible unites humanity in our identity. It says three things about us. First, all human beings are made in God's image. All human beings are naturally dead in our sin. All human beings need salvation in Christ. The fact that our, our identity is rooted in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God made us in his image, he made us, that means the most important thing about us is not our height, is not our intelligence, is not our athletic ability, it's not our race, it's not our parents' marital status, it's the fact that we were made in his image. Now, all of those other things matter. It's even okay to be proud of my athletic ability or height or race or whatever that is. But we can't put those things above the thing that God said is most important. And why does that matter? Because if we prioritize our height or our race or our marital status or whatever that is, we have inherently divided ourselves. Other people are different than me. The thing, I, the, the thing that defines me most specifically puts me at odds with somebody else. The gospel has a very different answer to how we view ourselves. When we first see ourselves as people who are made in the Im image of God, who are all dead in our sins, who are all in need of salvation in Christ, that unites everybody that you will ever meet. The most important thing about me makes me just like everybody in this room, everybody in this world. The most important thing about me makes me that way. CRT provides a very different answer. Now, why is this, these things, the fact that we're made in God's image, that we're dead in sin, and we're all in need of Jesus. These doctrines of human solidarity are the reason Christianity opposes racism, sexism, and classism. They are also the reason Christianity opposes critical theory, and for the exact same reasons. Because we cannot primarily see ourselves as anything other than people made in the image of God in need of Jesus. It's why we can't be racist. It's why we can't support critical theory. Because it requires us to see ourselves at odds as different than people that God says, no, you're all just like each other. The second point, the Bible says God is the final and objective source of truth. CRT disagrees. Theologians would refer to this as a different epistemology. There's a couple ways this happens, and I'm going to illustrate this uh, through a tweet from Union, Uni Union Seminary. I don't know how many of you follow Union Seminary, but they're really fun on Twitter. The second part of this, and I'll just highlight the part that, I've, that I have circled there. It says, and this is, again, a seminary, right? So they're supposed to be teaching people about the Bible. They say, while divinely inspired, we deny the Bible is inerrant and infallible. It was written by men over centuries and thus reflects both God's truth and human sin and prejudice. We affirm the biblical scholarship and critical theory help us discern which messages are God's. So they take the Bible and they say, we're going to take all this critical theory and we're going to view the scripture through the lens of critical theory and determine which of this is God and which of this is man. Right? So it's hard when you see this to argue that it's not a different worldview because it has a different foundation of the ultimate source of truth. Now, there's another way this happens. Critical race theory evaluates the truth of a claim after assessing the motives of the one making the claim. And I'm going to make this point through an example. Truth claim. You should forgive that person. Of course, we don't know what the context is, but that's the claim. You should forgive that person. <clears throat> Thinking biblically, your evaluation of that truth claim that someone has made is, does Jesus want me to forgive them? This is not a particularly complicated biblical answer. Done an easy one. It's hard sometimes, but it's not complicated, right? But that's the biblical evaluation. Does that truth claim 
comport with what I know Jesus has revealed to us. CRT does a different evaluation. They will first evaluate, what are the motives? What are their motives in telling me I should forgive them? What are they trying to do? Now, I, as by most standards, an oppressor, actually by all standards, I'm in the oppressed class, by all standards that CRT has. So I am, an, I am kind of a quintessential oppressor. So what they would say, if I told you to forgive someone, your response to me as a critical theorist would be, you're just trying to preserve your power. I want you to forgive and forget and let that move on because I want to continue, continue to control and dominate you. And your forgiveness serves my purpose in maintaining power and authority over you. That's the evaluation. Therefore, you are not obligated to consider the merits of my claim on its own. However, if I am not the white heteronormative Christian conservative that I am, and I was somehow in an oppressed category, here's the evaluation for you as a critical theorist who's just been told to forgive someone. You would say, you're suffering from an internalized oppression. You've been so thoroughly immersed in the dominant power structure that you're unable to recognize this. So even people who are oppressed, who say things that defend the patriarchy, that defend the white supremacist institutions, you can dismiss their arguments despite the fact that they are in the oppressed class because they have internalized oppression. They've been so immersed in the oppressive environment that they are actually parroting the arguments of the oppressive environment. And in that case, you are also free to ignore any claims that they make about forgiveness because they're still serving the purpose of the oppressed, of the oppressors. That's how truth is evaluated. And of course, those are very different ways. Um, ev the truth is the truth, even if a liar says it is how... Was that uh, Mark Twain? Is he the one who came up with that? Whatever it was. The third point. The Bible applies the same moral standard to everyone. CRT has a different moral standards for different people. I'm going to illustrate this with the curious case of Sarah Jong. She was hired by the New York Times a couple years ago. Uh, for the, and uh, in the process, some things that she had tweeted out became public knowledge. She said, oh man, it's kind of sick how much I enjoy getting, at, how much joy I get out of being cruel to white old men. That same year, are white people genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun, thus logically being only fit to live underground like groveling goblins? Now, this is, these are the ones without vanity, so I figured I could read these at church. Um, but these are things that we probably agree, I mean, it's unkind, at a bare minimum, if this was targeted at any other group, everybody would refer to this as racist, right? This would be racist. Now, but mind you, this is not racist, despite the appearance of this being racist, and here's why. Zach, po Zach Beauchamp, who's a writer for Vox, which is a publication you may not know about, and if you don't, bless you, but he wrote it, and this is what he, he said, the underlying power structure in American society is what difference these, differentiates these tweets, referring to Sarah Jong's tweets, from actual racism. Despite the appearance of them being racist, they are not racist because they are targeted at the oppressed class. Therefore, it's okay. Prayers of a weary black woman. And this is a little longer thing that I'm going to read to you, but I think it's important because it illustrates the same point. This is a collection of prayers. It's interesting that they use that word. And I'm going to read um, an excerpt from one of them. And it says, Dear God, please help me to hate white people, or at least to want to hate them. At least I want to stop caring about them individually and collectively. I want to stop caring about their misguided racist souls, to stop believing that they can be better, that they can stop being racist. My prayer is that you would help me to hate the other white people, you know, the nice ones, the Fox News-loving Trump-supporting voters who don't see color but make thinly-veiled racist comments about those people, the people who are happy to have me over for dinner but alert the neighborhood watch anytime an unrecognized person of color passes their house, the people who welcome black people in their churches and small groups but brand us as heretics if we suggest that Christianity is concerned with the poor and the oppressed. The people who politely tell us that we can leave when we call out the racial microaggressions we experience in their ministries. In most contexts, that's not kind. But in this context, it's appropriate because it's directed at the right, white, at the right people. As a moral, when we evaluate these things from a moral perspective, 
Who you're directing that at doesn't really matter. God, please help me to hate these people is in conflict with basically all of Scripture. You love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. How many times should we forgive? Seventy times seven. Or, God, help me to hate white people. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things while in the body, whether good or bad. God will repay each person, not according to what color they are and who their comments were directed to, but according to what they have done. I'm going to move on to number four very quickly. I am running out of time. The fourth point, the fourth way they, they conflict. The Bible assigns moral responsibility to those who are oppressed, even in their oppression. And this should be difficult for all of us because the, every one of us has been oppressors and every one of us has been oppressed in certain dynamics and certain ways in our lives. And I want to remind us what God says our responsibility is in those moments when life is hard for us, when we are pe- dr- being treated unjustly. And remember, Jesus is the most unjustly treated person that ever lived. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which spitefully use you and persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 4. If you love those who love you, what credit is that for you? For even sinners love those who love them. Very, very different way of dealing with the sins, the difficulties that life presents at us. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And fifth, critical theory is built on the rejection of hegemonic power. The Bible demands surrender to the hegemonic power of God. Heaven is one giant hegemonic scenario. And narrative. The Bible is one giant hegemonic story. In the beginning, God. That's the beginning of the hegemony. And I'm just going to read the last one because I'm out of town. Therefore, also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those who are in heaven and on earth and under earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As Christians, we're not opposed to hegemonic authority. We're opposed to hegemonic authority being in the hands of anyone other than Jesus. Summary, why critical theory isn't biblical. It gives us an unbiblical definition, ident- an unbiblical identity. It misidentifies our biggest problems and it misidentifies the solution to our problem. Racism is not the biggest problem in the world. Sin is. Racism is the fruit of the tree. It is not the tree. Even if we were all the same color, we would all find out ways to try to make ourselves feel better than other people and mistreat each other because we're all sinners and pride is the root of the problem. Should we fight racism? Absolutely. Will we eradicate racism? No. For the same reason we won't eradicate every other form of sin because it's not going to be done until Jesus comes and finishes it and restores all things. That's our hope. Now, do we fight evil? Do we fight oppression? Absolutely. But we keep it in context. None of this... None of this means racism isn't real. For those of us who are fortunate to live in America, we have privilege. Our lives are different because of our skin color. There are people today in their 60s who grew up in environments where they weren't allowed to go to school with white kids. There are people in their 30s and 40s whose parents and grandparents were beaten by the Klan. Some of them were lynched. They hear these stories from their family. That matters. 100 years ago, while my, my, while my great-grandparents were buying property on South Puget Sound, there were a lot of people whose grandparents couldn't buy anything because it was against the law. Does that affect my life today? Absolutely. Is that an advantage? Absolutely it is. Is that, is that part of our story? Absolutely it is. But the gospel also provides a way to deal. We can't go back in time and fix things. But... He must be slow to speak and quick to hear for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And these are difficult issues and other people do not have the same experience as you and you do not have the same experience as other people. And as believers, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen. We should be quick to bear one another's burdens. We don't have to agree with everybody's conclusion to recognize life is hard for everybody. And ultimately, though, in in 
in our moments of sympathy and empathy and, and trying to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, point them toward the only real solution to the problem. That's Jesus. Final point I'm going to make, the CRT encourages you to place your hope in the wrong place. That's fundamentally why it's a problem. Political revolution is not going to solve our world's problems. No election is going to solve our world's problems. The last guy had problems. This guy has problems, right? We're all aware of that. We're live, man. The gospel is always putting, God is always putting his finger under our chin and turning our eyes upward. There are so many things in life that are encouraging us to look down. Navel gaze or just look out and think about all these problems. And Jesus is the only one who can solve them. We, we misplace our hope in so many different ways, in our relationships, in our money, in our success, in our good looks, in whatever we think we have going for us, or our pain and our shame. That define us too. But the primary message I want you to take home today is not that critical race theory is a bad idea. There's lots of bad ideas. Don't let anything in your life it takes your eyes off Jesus as the ultimate solution, and especially in the church. It comes into the church and encourages us to try to look for political solutions to spiritual, eternal problems. Don't be deceived. Keep your eye, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full to his wonderful grace, for the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these uh, friends. And thank you for your word, which does reveal to us truth and the path of life. And we ask for your word to, uh, to sink deep into our hearts. That, uh, that it, any error that I have spoken today, other people would forget quickly. And any truth that has been presented here today would, would uh, take a great root. And that you would, in, in all of this, in a challenging world, um, show us the ways in which we are fixing our hope on the wrong things. And God, help us to be most committed not to exposing other people's lies, but to the lies in our own lives. And that we would uh, give ourselves wholly and completely to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You know, I, you talk about submission to God. And that's, that's ultimately what this is all about. And if I were to ask um, you to raise your hand, how many struggle sometimes submitting to God in his wisdom ways in all of life? Yeah. Probably all of us are going to raise our, our hands, aren't we? But yeah. that's what this is about. So thank you so much. Um, tonight we'll be gathering again at 6 p.m. We have a panel. Um, we have people of color who will be speaking. You, you, you spoke about lived experience, you know, and we're going to kind of unwrap this a, a little bit more. How do we as followers of Jesus live this Live this life out, submitted to him. Right. Amen. Amen. So you're all invited tonight. You have an opportunity to text in your questions. Let's stand together, shall we? And uh, let's join together in our final worship song. Oh, my 
gives us life. He gives us hope. He gives us freedom. Go in his love, serve him, reflect who he is. Let's love everyone around us and stand on the truth of the the gospel and the Bible. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. service and that guest speaker uh, that I was talking to you about uh, since uh, what day was that Friday critical race theory and its relation to the Christian church a lot of things to unpack there probably what I think should be done because there was so much said in such a short amount of time uh I began to comment on one thing and five more things were said within a span of 15 seconds. There's no way I could type that fast. What I think would be the most uh, effective and purposeful 
way to address this is to do another broadcast, invite some folks on, and dissect it piece by piece. I think that might be the most effective way to have that conversation. I do believe it's important to listen. As I've said to you for the last two days, people are entitled to their thoughts, how they think, what they believe. Now, facts are facts. And that could be one of the things that is dangerous about Bible interpretation, right? As I was saying before, there are so many different versions. <clears throat> One, there are many versions of the Bible. There are many denominations of Christianity. And in that, even in the church itself, an individual body, people can interpret chapters and verses very differently. And that's how you have splits from different churches, right? And as humans, we often want to seek out what makes us feel good. We are looking for somewhat of an echo chamber. We want to feel good. We want to hear the word <clears throat> or whatever it may be. But if it's too counter to our thinking, we're going to reject it, right? A Christian person isn't going to be practicing Muslim or vice versa, right? It's too counter to your belief, your set of values. And in that, actually discerning, having that power of discernment on what the truth is, is a slippery slope. Especially when you couple that with <clears throat> praying for understanding. Lord, I pray for understanding that you will guide my heart. You will guide the words. And in some regards, I almost feel like people use that as a way to say, hey, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm trying to be obedient to God. I'm reading the word. And this is how I interpret this. This is how my leadership says I should interpret this. They have went out and requested guest speakers to come in and bolster these ideas. And so therefore, I agree with that. I believe that. And because of my faith in God, <clears throat> I've prayed about it. And now I can move in faith that this interpretation is in, in truth, the truth. And we are all behaving and acting in ways that are pleasing in God's sight. And if not, as he was saying in the prayer of convenience at the end, God, please forgive my mistakes and help the people forget quickly. <laughs> I've actually never heard a prayer like that. And again, I shouldn't make judgment on <clears throat> how someone prays. But what you say is very interesting especially when you have the analysis the critique is fair because this person has put themselves in the public sphere and has said a number of controversial things and to that end to just ask for forgiveness and forgetness quickly What are the mistakes? Where did you go wrong? In the Bible somewhere, it talks about the shepherd who leads the flock astray. Woe to that person. So 
So again, very disingenuous. <clears throat> All things are theory until proven. As I said before, CRT is about a framework, looking at things through a lens, the lens of, hey, this is grounded in racist behavior, that these systems are racist, and those, the people that are in these systems, uphold the institution of racism in order for it to continue to work. And that's why when he talks about Larry Elder and other black people that are against things like critical race theory or other BIPOC individuals, anyone can uphold the institution of white supremacy the institution of racism. That's how it works, right? We will let you play the game. We'll allow you to ascend the floors of power. But this is how you play the game. And if you don't play the game that way, you won't be here. So we have intellectual dishonesty all over the place where they can somehow not see someone acting traitorous to their own people. Right or wrong, there's no better current example than what's going on in Afghanistan right now. The U.S. came in and for 20 years, occupied a nation. And those that sided with the United States to make the changes that they wanted to see change to bring Western democracy into that region, they're now terrified and scared for their lives. Because now that the U.S. has withdrawn, the Taliban is going door to door and taking folks out. Same Afghan people, right? Folks hanging on airplanes, falling to their death. What person could actually believe they can hang on to a plane at 500 miles an hour at 30,000 feet in the air? So it's dishonest to say, oh, I can't understand how Larry Elder could be a white supremacist or uphold the ideology to support to maintain, to further. Those are dangerous people. And over the course of history, those that have been traitorous to their own people have been dealt with. So one of the reasons why slavery lasted as long as it did. Because you had Slaves who, through meritorious manumissions, <clears throat> and again, that's getting something for helping the master, an invention, stopping a slavery revolt. To get a few extra crumbs, maybe to be in the house, to get whip less, to be the person holding the whip. We can make it even easier that a child can understand. You've been in the room. Maybe you were this kid, the one that's always telling. Oh, you doing dirt too. Oh, 
Marwan did such and such. And didn't no one tell you to tell? Anyone have parents that used to beat you because you told? Like, stop snitching on your brother. Stop snitching on your sister. And you would actually get in trouble. So again, I can give you very simple under examples that children can understand. And this isn't just the right. The right and the left do this. All of a sudden, they can't understand how someone who is not of the oppressing class could also be a part of the oppression. No systems are perfect. That's true. None will be. But that is not an excuse to not do anything about it. As in the chat, I find it very convenient that you could attack a thing. Say that it's bad, right? Acknowledge racism is bad. And, you know, what happened way back when was horrible. And, you know, things are a lot better now. And yeah, 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 there's there's pockets. There's a few bad apples here and there. But you know what? We're not going to end it. God will fix it when he comes back. But then turn your gaze to other things that the church is very full-throated about being for or against. I also find it interesting that we are being told to forgive 77 times. When in typical fashion, they themselves don't seem to do that. Do you participate in evil? Do you help to keep evil systems going and in place? As in my example yesterday, when I talked about an arrest, whether justified or not, let's say it was an arrest with no incident, just very calm, taken into custody, no issue. One charge for the black individual, one charge for the white individual. Best case scenario, the black individual gets sentenced to longer time than the white individual, all things being equal. And if in your head, the first thing that popped into your head was, well, did the black person have a previous record? See, that's the problem right there. because you probably didn't think about it the other way. Many of us have seen jury shows, court shows, jury selections. We've heard the news, we've watched. And we see jury of your peers And how overwhelmingly there's a lack therein of us who are on trial, having a jury of our peers. 
people who don't look at us with the implicit and explicit biases that have been hammered into them time and time again. And we see it everywhere. Racism doesn't just exist in the few bad police. Our school teachers, our lawyers, our teachers, our CEOs, our coworkers, our fellow students, our employees, our employers, You know, we do transportation uh, as a part of the services we offer for my nonprofit. And in that, we picked up this racist white man. And he would say the most vile thing. And as a favor to another agency, we have continued to serve this individual. And mainly because we look at it as actually serving the organization. But we don't subject any of our black drivers to that. Racism is everywhere. We face it everywhere. Even from those who are down and out. So is racism normal? Yes. Can you see it in everything? That's what critical race theory is about. And it's been around since the 80s. This isn't new. They have been looking at this for a long period of time. And the anecdotal stories that are told, if a person told the exact same story over and over again, that might be one thing. And that was the case back in 91 with Rodney King, right? First time it was really on videotape. And even still they got off. But there's still so much cognitive dissonance, still so much. Who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? With all of the film footage that we have. with all of the comparison of the video that we watched and the police report that was written. We've seen the planting of drugs in different cities across the nation. So it's not a few bad apples. It is systemic. And when good officers, when black officers, Asian officers, Latino officers, when LGBTQI plus officers don't speak up, don't speak out, watch the bad actors do what they do, then they are upholding the system, which is what makes it systemic. That should be really easy to understand. And I do believe that's really easy to understand.
Are there good people in a hopeless situation? Sure. Are there folks that are good that get into a field and say, you know what, I'm going to try to change it? Many of us have. Many of us are in these spaces now. But once you give up the fight, once you stop speaking out against the injustice, because it's going to impact your family, your ability to make money, the clout, the power, the fame, the security, whatever it is that is your motivating drive, then you have become part of the engine, the systemic system that ensures that it keeps going. I will agree with him on the fact that it is very difficult to find out information on the four of critical race theory. What's dangerous is to go to Wikipedia as your baseline source. I think that's part of a larger problem with society currently. But for scholars to study critical race theory since the 80s, almost 40 years, right? To say, you know what? I'm going to drill it down to what I found on Wikipedia, and then I'm going to chop it up based on that. And I couldn't find This isn't the first time he has spoken on this. You can go and check out his YouTube channel. I I believe those videos may be a year old. So he's had plenty of time to do an earnest research of what CRT is. He's had plenty of times, plenty of time to do a deep dive on what the true argument is. And as a Christian, is it right to say, hey, you know what? I know that critical race theory is a theory that is theorized and investigated and researched at the collegiate level. And what is being asked is that actual U.S. history is taught, not whitewashed, sanitized, romanticized versions of what slavery was, how oppression continued after to talk about Selma, Black Wall Street, and all the other dozens of cities, the hangings, the cross burnings, chasing people out of town, taking their property, raping their women, kids, men, the prison industrial complex. So knowing that it's two different things, that would seem like a very unchristian thing to do to say is, you know what, I know that this isn't really what the argument is, but because this is going to support my point, I'm going to go ahead and go with it.
It's why we have so much trouble in this country in the first place. We're willing to cheat to win. Your analysis is based on dishonesty. And then you whip up low information voters. Low information parents, teachers, worshipers. and then send them out into the world. And this is what we have. So a truth that's built on a lie, can it be true? You know, the um, the arguments that I like the best or those that argue, debate, analyze positions and points are those that can look at things from both sides, that can critically think, that can call out the good and the bad and say, you know what? This isn't my thing. I've got other things that I want to champion. Abortion, immigration, women's rights, whatever. But if racism is your issue and it impacts me, then I'm going to jump in and I'm going to, I know, I already know how I feel, right? Right? especially if I feel that, you know, the folks that have been oppressed now say they, they don't want to be oppressed anymore. They want you to acknowledge it. They want it to be taught. They want the truth, the actual truth. They want reconciliation. They want justice. They want reparations. Okay. Well, I feel some kind of way about that. Just off the rip, not for it. Don't agree. But I would submit that maybe the Christian thing to do would be to say, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to investigate what are you saying? Why do you think the way that you do? What is your evidence? Could I put myself in your position? What would I want if the shoe was on the other foot? What would make it better? And honestly, make it better, right? We have folks that will get up and say, oh, I don't, I don't want no reparations. I don't want this. I don't want that. So uh, a video with Herschel Walker and his son, right? Doing a, a podcast or an interview in a palatial kitchen that's probably bigger than my entire house. Talking about how he doesn't want reparations and what that feels like begging for money. And as the speaker was talking about, one of the questions that I had or one of the comments was he was saying, you know, you get paid more based on your height. Data is important. So where did that data come from? Hmm. 
Now, did they just look at the height and take the general salaries of people? Because if you take the basketball players, well, typically seven footers are in the top, what, 0.001%. This is now your football players, 6'5, 6'4, 6'3, your baseball players. Is it true that these people make millions of dollars in aggregate? And someone who is 5'1 or 5'2, what is the apparatus typically to which they make money at that level? The 5'11, I don't think Spud Webb's not even that tall. Was he like 5'8, five, 5'9? Those are outliers, right? Those people don't typically make it in the league. And when they do, Muggsy Bogues, they're not in the league for long periods of time. Correlation there. So that's important. What is disgusting is that a comparison like that would even be made, right? His argument was we should, if we're going to be upset about racism and critical race theory, then we should be, you know, just as concerned about, you know, the, the income range based on height. but your height isn't what got you raped. Good morning, Rev. Your height isn't what got you murdered. The height isn't what got you enslaved. The height isn't what got your house devalued. Your height isn't what got you not to get the job, even though you were as qualified or more qualified for the position. The height isn't what caused you to not get a fair trial. Comparisons are dangerous. And people that aren't critical thinkers, they say, hey, you know what? You're right. If people at different heights get paid different amounts of money based on the taller they are, the more their income goes up, then that is an injustice. That is wrong. And we don't do anything about that. So, yeah, we shouldn't do anything about uh, institutional structural racism. Woe to the person who teaches God's people and leads them astray. And again, if you want to believe that, if you want to go over and say, you know what? Yep, I'm going to go with that argument. That works. That somehow the oppression of a people that has continued to this day is somehow on the level of the discomfort that you feel because people are talking about how you're you, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your great great grandparents, and on have oppressed a race of people. And how even today we participate in our own oppression. 
in order to ascend and sit in positions in the society that we've built in your image. Honest discussion, critical thinking. As I was saying in my podcast yesterday, CRT, again, is a theory for college folks to analyze through the lens of racism. But the argument is, is our schools need to be taught true American history. And the lie is that it's critical race theory which is being taught. As I shared with you yesterday, my learnings, my takeaways from my elementary school years, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, the three ships of Columbus, right? Columbus discovers America. He breaks bread with the Indians. They trade Thanksgiving. We cut little turkeys and colored them in. That's not what Columbus was about at all, right? That's the whitewashed sanitized version that we're talking about. And talk about the murder and the disease and the rape and all the other things that took place. I think folks are right when they say, if you want a change, if you want America to heal, if you want America to be strong, And strong in a legitimate way, not not strong in, you know, we've got the most powerful military many times over. Might is right. We're the bully on the block, so we can do and think how we want to. We will destroy you. If you really want to be powerful... Do you really want to be the paragon of the planet in regards to countries? <clears throat> and you have to address your sins because we navigate as the world police. And we tell the world, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. It's how we're in Afghanistan for 20 years. So we can point out the sty in everyone else's eye, but we can't point out the sty in our own sanctimonious and self-righteous. This doesn't seem very Christian-like to me. Shout out, Naja. Teach American history. This isn't black history. This is American history. Tell the truth. Kids are resilient. As I was saying yesterday, the movies you allow them to watch, the music you let them listen to, the way that many of you allow them to talk to you. Some of these kids curse like sailors. No offense to sailors. what they do on TikTok when they begin using drugs and alcohol, when they become sexually active. Kids are very resilient and forward thinking, but somehow they can't handle the actual truth. What happens in your own household? The domestic violence, the mental violence. 
the racist thoughts that are being taught and handed down, the neglect. But this you got to protect the kids from. Those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. I would say there's a correlation with denying, hiding. The city of Black Wall Street, they actually admitted, started taking out pictures, reports, newspaper clippings, swore the town to secrecy, and those that overkept the actual knowledge. And a hundred years later, it's just now coming out. So, of course, we're doomed to repeat it. See, back in the 60s, it was just the Klan. Now it's the Klan and the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. And, I mean, it goes on and on. Hate groups and militia groups increased by 400% under Obama's presidency. doomed to repeat it. But see, it's hard to criticize, condemn your brother, your sister, your uncle, your auntie, your mother, your father, your grandparents, your cousin, your brothers and sisters when they're a part of those groups. And those conversations are being had at the dinner table, at the holiday functions, in the workplace. Can't reconcile that. I love my dad. I love my mother. My grandmother, she's the sweetest little thing to you and yours. But was she the one that had Emmett Till beat unrecognizable? Was she the one that sewed the sheets? Was she the one that taught the kids on what black people were and how to treat us and what to believe about us? Go back and look at the old footage of watching us break lines and go into schools and ride buses and sit at countertops. Look at the parents. Look at all the children. The hangings back in the day used to be a spectacle, an event. Children were present, which means they were being taught. So it continues today. And it is tremendously dangerous. And this is why you see in the Kitsap Sun and E-Race and the Human Rights Commission of Kitsap County come out and speak out against this particular gentleman. Because not only is he espousing these things based on the fallacy of a Wikipedia argument for a CRT, which isn't even going to be taught in the classroom, but saying, hey, you know what, this isn't the Christian thing to do. But that he would link it into the church and give it a, a, a religious morality and righteousness to deny and destroy justice, to rectify, to tell the truth. What's interesting is in this country, 
we don't really have i mean what was what was jail what it, what was prison right you do a crime you do something wrong you are sentenced and while you're doing your time you are supposed to reflect come out become a better person and then you are restored into the rest of society and on you go as a contributing member But what it really is, is uh, an extension of slavery, right? Working for 24 cents an hour, working for, oh, let's see, Victoria's Secret, working for the government, giving people extra long sentences, spitting them back out after their time is done with little resource, education, or knowledge. Then you pass bills to say, hey, well, you know, if you were convicted of this crime, well, you're not going to be eligible for any kind of state assistance, no housing, no food stamps. But no one hires a felon. So what are they supposed to do? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps twice. Hmm. Good luck with that. Again, if things are going to change, we have to get involved. We can no longer sit on the sidelines tweeting. It's not enough. Sharing a post is not enough. You know, the saying evil never sleeps is a very true story. See the good get weary. We want to rest. We want to spend time with our kids. We work so hard, we're working two and three jobs. We're taking care of our children. We're doing all the things that we can. And in the meantime, the folks that have the discretionary income, the discretionary time, are plotting and planning, sitting on committees, boards, running for office. And we don't even know what's happening. As I told you before, the buy and fours that came and spoke a few Mondays ago are absolutely right. You got to get involved. You don't need a degree. You just need you, your lived experience, your willingness to be present, to share information, to share your thoughts, your ideas. As I keep sharing with you, oftentimes it's the same people on four, five, six, seven, eight committees. So what voice is heard? What change takes place? Even if they look like you, they still have their set of things that they want, things that they envision. So do the things that matter to you get left out? Yeah. Now, I will tell you that predominantly these spaces are occupied by many middle-aged white women. But as far as our community, what you'll see is black women. It's a good thing. The bad thing is that there are an absence of black men in these spaces. And while we all can say we advocate for us as a people, I identify as a man. They identify as women. So they want to do something for black girls. So who is advocating for the black boys? Who is advocating for the black men? I shared with you in a previous podcast on the demographics of homelessness and how high the percentages of black Americans that are homeless, how most of the homeless are actually men, not women, not families. But the focus 
the shelters are primarily based on women and women and children. And when that is the case, then a man can't be there. I told you a story before on how a single mother was staying in a women's shelter, and because her son turned 18, her whole family had to leave the shelter because that boy now, on paper, has become a man. The most kindest, gentle boy, child, you'd ever want to know. But now he's homeless because he turned 18. So who's advocating for the men? Who's advocating for our black men in these spaces when they're predominantly women? I thought about actually taking pictures of the different Zoom meetings that I'm in. And you'll see, you know, it looks like the Partridge family or was it the Brady Bunch or Hollywood Squares. And you see all the faces in there and you look and it's like white woman, white woman, white woman, white man, black woman, white woman, white woman. Racially ambiguous person, white man, white woman, black woman, racially ambiguous person. There have been days where I've been in four meetings in the same day, all very different things. And it's like, oh, you again. Oh, you again. Hey, how you doing? Oh, you here too? And I'm actually not mad at those folks, right? They understand the need and they have prioritized it. And they've said, look, someone's got to be here so that our voices are heard, that we're present. And the problem is, is the problem that we have with, you know, many organizations, especially volunteer, right? We have challenges with staffing. And so... You know, every Monday and Thursday, it's, it's like all hands on deck. We need everybody. And I think sometimes what happens is folks are like, you know, when everyone is there, like, oh, look at all these people. All right, I'll be good this Thursday. They got plenty of people. The problem is, is when three or four people think that same thought, then you only have two people there to help. And it happens more than you think, and it's unfortunate. And the job's got to get done, so they do it. But when those folks fall down, when they wear out, when they're no longer there, and the advocacy and the support is gone, That's part of what makes the work so challenging and difficult, right? It's like, oh, I hear it about my dad. Man, your dad was an awesome man. He was this, he was that. He did this for me. He was, oh, man, Reverend Cameron. He's gone. He's gone, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, in in the last days of his life, one, he's prideful, so he's not really going to ask for help. But we know the help that people need. You know what help we need. You know what we go through. You know how hard we work. You know where our deficits are and our blind spots are. Hold us up. I just shared with someone the other day that we are providing food to a family. And they pay us to do so. In this particular family, I believe there's enough people in this community. And for the things that they've done in this community, we shouldn't have been hired to do that.
Remember I said winter is coming, but winter is actually already here. We're a year and a half in on this pandemic. We see that this Delta variant is out of control. We've got breakthrough infections. We have breakthrough deaths. More and more kids are getting COVID or going to the emergency room. And for us, school starts in a week or so. The moratorium is not likely to be extended again. Evictions are going to start. The money is going to wear out. And oh, by the way, we just ended a war in Afghanistan. And so now all of those refugees need housing. If you haven't watched the news, watch. The buses have already started rolling in cities. They need housing. They need food. They need medical. They need jobs. They need training. They need support. There's only so many resources to go around. And thinking, you know, the government is going to help us out and bail us out. Mm. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I don't think most of us are just living the life. You might be able to get lit for a second, but life ain't lit in general. We have got to learn how to take care of each other. We've got to learn how to work together. If the Delta variant turns to something else, there is a Lambda variant out there, as I said before. I don't know what all the different words are, what the what the J variant would be or the, the K Who knows? We're so resilient as a people. It's hard to remember when there wasn't food on the shelves, when there wasn't toilet paper, a hand sanitizer. And we just watched CNN and other news channels just sh showing this many deaths per day, this many people infected a day. The uncertainty. We don't remember that. Why? Because, well, football was last night. Basketball. And the World Series. And soccer. The Olympics. Concerts. And all the distractions. In some cities, the, the story is You've got to wait for one child to die to make room for another one in certain hospitals because that's how overrun they are. But it's not here, so it doesn't affect me where I'm at to that level. I'm healthy. My family's pretty good. We're good. The problem is even our Silverdale Hospital is full. The folks are tired. They're burnt out. So when you have an emergency, even if it's not COVID, what is your quality of care? Do you want a rested nurse? A rested doctor? That doesn't miss something in your diagnosis? Or do you want the ultra-fatigued medical staff? I think they were just saying in, in the sun, there was a woman who had, I can't remember what she had, but she literally was in the, she didn't get a room for 24 hours. She was in the hall. It's summertime, guys. It's 80, 90, 100 degrees. We're just coming out of the end of summer. We're just coming into the cold season. Or I should say cool season. Not even the cold season yet. Cold and flu season is coming up on us really quickly. All these kids are about to be back in school. I don't know about you. I know the mandate goes into effect on Monday for wearing masks. But 
I go into the grocery store. I went into Safeway the other day. I was the only person with a mask on aside from the employees. And people literally looked at me like I was crazy. Like there was something wrong with me. Hmm. But if I could get a breakthrough case and I'm vaccinated, do I want to give it to my nine-year-old asthmatic daughter? Do I want to risk my lung disease with COVID? We watch those that are anti-vaxxers against the vaccine all of a sudden get sick. Now they're in the hospital bed and now they want the vaccine. Oh, it's real now. My question is, what is it, over 600,000 deaths? Something like that. With whatever you think about fake news, big pharma, the government and their stories and lies, whatever you think about that, you have to know somebody who's been affected by this. The children who have lost their parents, the whole families that have been wiped out, the long haul COVID survivors that still have symptoms a year later. Just wearing a mask that hard. And see, a good portion of this does come from the right side of the Christian church, right? Is that the Christian thing to do? Critical thinking is beyond just thinking. Thinking about hunger. That's thinking. Critically thinking about hunger might be, why is there hunger? What are the reasons why people go hungry? What are some solutions? What's already being done? Critical thinking. If you think about race theory, the theory that racism exists in all the institutions. And so you have a hypothesis or a theory because you're going to go to critical thinking and not just thinking about it. Oh, racism exists. That was racist. That could be racist. Is it? I would say critical race theory is actually a good thing. Because what it's saying is, is you know what? This is the idea that has been presented. Let's go and investigate and see if this is actually true. Now, yes, there can be some fallacies in someone looking for an answer to a question they've already answered in their own mind with their own bias. But I think more than not, most people in their analyzing of theory actually want to know whether or not the theory is sound. Or are there other factors that can impact the experience that a person goes through? So I think that would be a good thing. 
because what it could produce is one or two things. One, okay, we haven't really looked, right? People have said, yes, I feel like I'm experiencing racism and oppression in housing. Okay. So we're going to take a, take a look at redlining. We're going to take a look at lending. We're going to take a look at buying. Are you sold property at higher amounts? Are you only able to buy in certain areas? Redlining. Does your house appraise for more if you stage it with a white family versus staging it with yourself? Still happens today. Are you told that there are no vacancies in areas that people don't want black people to live in? Is there gentrification? Yes. So let's analyze that. Okay, if the first answer is yes, why? What are the factors? Who are the gatekeepers? What are the systems that are in place? What allows these systems to continue? How can we dismantle those systems if that's what needs to happen? Can they be dismantled? Is it a byproduct of something else? What's first, police brutality or the prison industrial complex and over-sentencing? Chicken and the egg. Is one a catalyst for the other or is it all stemmed from something further back, which is slavery? And because we haven't reconciled and dealt with that yet, that there continues to be injustice in sentencing. And then it's just a snake eating its tail, right? So whatever you think is first, if a person is sentenced to more time, charged with more charges, if the police only police in high areas of minorities. The stat that I read to you yesterday talked about, didn't matter where it is, it's just that black and brown people are more likely to be pulled over because it's discretionary by cops. So after all these charges are set, does that fuel the bias of the police to continue to do that? And as I said yesterday, why don't the police go to the sorority and the fraternity houses? Because there's a lot of drug and alcohol use there. There's a lot of underage drinking there. There's a lot of statutory rape happening there. So I would say it's a good thing. And because it's not a closed system, it's open for people to theorize, to do research, to investigate, like we do with Einstein and Newton and all the other theorists that have come up with their theories to either be proved, disproved, or waiting to still be proved. Wormholes, multiverse, lots of different theories that are out there. So as I was saying before, I think the most effective way to do this would be I'm glad, you know, for those of you that were able to join and watch the live broadcast of him speaking. He's actually speaking again right now. He is live. Uh, and then there's going to be a Q&A session tonight at 6 p.m. What I would 
submit to you is let us reconvene at another time today, either before or after his 6 p.m. Q&A. I know there are people that are going to want to go out and either protest or be in attendance of this event so that he can answer questions. But I think the most effective way to unpack this, and Rev, hopefully you're still on listening. I know your service has started, is to go through kind of frame by frame. Right? This is, as he said in the beginning, you know, he was, this was put on the schedule months ago. This isn't the first time that he has spoke about this. So he's had time to prepare his thoughts. He's had time to do his research. And unfortunately, he decided to do his research on CRT from Wikipedia. Which to me tells me that he's already coming from a dishonest space. And not to say that he doesn't make any points. That's not what I'm saying. I'd actually love to be impartial and allow the audience to be the ones to provide their critique and their analysis and their thoughts to either support or counter what this man is saying. I think that would be the most effective and purposeful use of our time. But as I said before, I think it's a good idea that we actually do hear what people have to say. Oh, I appreciate that. So what would you guys say? Should we come back before the 6 p.m. Q&A or should we come back? I know people have things to do on Monday. So 8.30 might be a little long. But we could come back maybe at 3.30 or 4. And what I will do is I will play his uh, presentation. I don't think that was a sermon. I'll play his presentation and we'll just pause and react. So I think there was a lot said there. Like I said, I started to type responses and I couldn't go fast enough because he was, he was saying so many things that required uh, response to. What I will do is I will make a... Um, I'll create a show, and you'll see that on both uh, Facebook and YouTube. And then you'll be able to chime in. If you want to verse yourself. Oh, so the the question was, we need to have a conversation about what what he said. And I think the best way to do that would be to actually replay what he said and break it down. I think that that would be the most purposeful use of our space, right? Because he said a lot there. And for those that are are versed in the Bible, it would definitely be great to have you come in and either support or refute what is being said there. And as I was saying, he's had time months to prepare this and for those of us in the community many of us didn't even know this man was coming and many unfortunately of our parents whose kids are either going to be well subjected to a version of history, Nina, Pinta, Santa Maria, Christopher Columbus had a picnic with the Indians, or they're going to get actual American history. So 
So, and so what I was saying was I could create it at 4 p.m. I'll send out an invite. Uh, you'll see it on Facebook and YouTube. If you want to rewatch it, it's he, it's very short. I don't think he spoke for more than about 15 minutes or so. So that you, you can have your thoughts together. I think that's very powerful for those that will watch this later and have no idea what CRT is, have no idea on the fallacy the argument is built on. And even how this relates to Christianity and what Christian responsibility is. Because his viewpoint was more of an abstinence of dealing with race. It's bad. Nothing we can do about it. Wait till Jesus comes back. He'll handle it. Was kind of how he <laughs> was his answer to it. And as I said before, evangelicals, right wing church, typically don't take that position when it comes to abortion, women's rights, immigration, and other issues. So why does racism get this benign neglect? So do you think four o'clock would be a good time? That way that for those that want to either attend the 6 p.m. Q&A in person or online, which I can and will broadcast that also, can make sure that they're a part of that and ask their questions or make their comment. It is important, even if people do not agree with you and say some outlandish things, you need to know how people think. And unfortunately, many of these people that think in some very counter ways and maybe even some dangerous ways are those that are the decision makers for you and your family. So it is time to get active. Take that from another YouTuber. <laughs> I listen to him a lot. Four to six sounds good to me. Four and six. Okay. So then that's what I'll do. I'll create, uh, I'll end this broadcast. I'll create one at four. You'll see if you have subscribed to my channel, please do. At YouTube, just type in Marwan Cameron, and then you will find the conduit. There's a lot of things called the conduit, so that is the easiest way to do that. You can friend me on YouTube. Send me a friend request. You can also follow us on Gather Together, Grow Together. YouTube is great, though. And please subscribe, like, and share. We got to get the message out. We have really powerful shows coming up this week that you and yours will benefit from. I will see you at 4 o'clock. I'm Marwan, and this is...